Great. Well, good morning, uh, uh, good afternoon, good evening, um, good night, good day, uh, wherever you are in the world. And welcome once again to the uh, BAPT conference, the 33rd BAPT conference, uh, under the title The New Normal People Type and the Post Pandemic World. My name is Jerry Gilpin. I'm on the board of the BAPT, and it's my pleasure, particularly tonight, to welcome you to. One Strategy 16 Tactics, uh, which uh, is going to be uh, presented for us by Roger Pierman. Uh, Roger hardly needs any introduction, I'm sure, as a leading figure in the development and application of type uh, instruments uh, over many years and as an author and partner in a talent management company. I can personally thoroughly recommend the, uh, the Pierman Personality Integrator, uh, which I've used for myself and with clients. Um, and I'm really excited to welcome you tonight, Roger, once again to BAPT. Thank you for taking the time to be with us and we are in your hands. Thank you very much, Jerry, and uh, congratulations to you and all members of the conference committee for pulling off another successful event. Uh, looking at all the topics and being able to hear some of the presenters has really uh, spoken to uh, how important it is for us to have our annual gatherings and sharing our insights and observations as we uh, attempt to make sense of our now, uh, if you will, COVID uh, influenced world in some way. <clears throat> in some ways, uh, this presentation represents um, a summation of a variety of cogitations, thoughts, and pieces that I've been doing uh, for a number of years. And I am going to say some things which confirm a lot of what many of you already think and know about psychological type. And the, perhaps there'll be some things I'll say that you will uh, want to reflect on longer before you reject. Uh, but might not necessarily land as uh, uh, <laughs> comfortably as some of the tried and true uh, observations that we sometimes have about about type. <clears throat> I, um, as I've thought about psychological type and a discussion that's been going on for some years amongst a number of type researchers has been how do we enable a newer generation of folks um, to come to fully embrace and understand the richness and power of type uh, and how do we do it in a way that really invites them to use the model and the framing and the language in the most uh, comfortable way we all know we've all seen it the explosion of materials on type out there in the world and when you click on it you often read materials and you think to yourself oh my 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 where did that come from um, and it it leads to a dilution of the power and the value of of type so i I've been pondering for some time, what are ways that we can make this model, if you will, um, as engaging and powerful for the next generation as it has been for many of us. I am sure <clears throat> that there are many of us who attended this conference who had the experience uh, some years ago when they were first introduced to type um, the internal uh, acknowledgement, if you will, of, of one's self being okay. Um, the internal awareness that other people see the world like I do in ways that um, I didn't realize until the gift of type uh, gave us that chance. Um, I, I feel very strongly about how to make this perspective um, available and and the reason I feel strongly about it is being trained really as a developmental psychologist and being trained in um, a whole array of uh, models like I'm sure many of you have it is still the case that type is one of the most constructive 
frames allows for one of the most constructive sets of, if you will, conversations about difference uh, that um, is really, really quite remarkable. So please understand that as I go through this material with you, that it's really a part of what's been a long journey for me. Uh, I just recently revised I'm Not Crazy, I'm Just Not You. Uh, I'm Not Crazy, I'm Just Not You came out in, in the early 90s, 1990s, for my first effort to talk about the evidence that had been collected. And as I've thought about this revision and sharing the new insights and observations, it caused me to reflect on the fact that when I was working on this material uh, for the first time, uh, I um, uh, had a confluence of influences. Uh, for example, Hemio Storm of the Cheyenne tribe here in the United States is a wise soul who, uh, in talking about how his tribal languaging and perspectives of development have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, it doesn't take you but just an instant to realize he's talking about type. Uh, when he talks about the patterns, the four ways of perception, when he talks about the linkages between um, development and experience and the way that occurs in the life of uh, the Cheyenne uh, tribal folks, but it was those conversations and the evidence coming around um, that was being collected at the time that led to I'm not crazy, I'm just not you, and each revision I've attempted to include um, some new things, and I am now working on a revision of you. Um, that book <clears throat> continues to be uh, used in a lot of coaching scenarios, but I now have some some more international data that I, I want to include in that work. And I, all this is to say to you simply, in this journey I've been on for the last 45 years with psychological type, I have found that it is a great source of um, information to help other people. And it's a great source of information that's been a part of my own growth and development. And I know in this short time we have together today, uh, as is really um, my hope is, as I hope in any of the pieces that I've been able to do, that I'm able to lean into Emily Dickinson's observation that she thought her work would ignite the imagination and light the slow fuse of the possible. And I'm hoping that the work that I've continued to do and the work that, that I'm sharing with you will in some way uh, do that as well. Now, you might wonder, why did I use the word strategy and the word tactic in coming to this presentation? And hopefully, um, I hope you will um, uh, be patient with me as I share with you that it occurred to me as I thought about the big picture of using type in all these years in coaching and leadership development, um, in career counseling and, and in the university setting when I was director of a learning center. It occurred to me that as we think about a strategy, which is this plan to achieve an overall or long-term uh, goal or objective, and that their tactics that are employed to help reach that strategy, it naturally led to the question, well, what is psychological type um, if it isn't a strategy the psyche uses? Psychological type is, from the perspective of the whole system, it's a strategy the psyche uses that has evolved over eons of, of human history that's designed to enable us to manage and adapt and adjust to all the challenges that we face. And because we know specialization has been a part of the human journey, that specialization 
has shown itself in many, many ways, such as getting us to specialize, if you will, in particular ways of perceiving and making decisions. And so, as I thought about it, that that psychological type, the, the, the strategy of type is to help us make our perceptions clearer and our judgments more sound, to use Isabel Meyer's observation. It is Jung's observation as well that it is our type which does create the one-sidedness that we we wind up getting stuck in unless we get a handle on the whole and unless we uh, decide that we want to leverage the, the 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 secrets if you will and the insights of the psyche as we move forward in life and one of the ways that we can get a handle on this such that it's not so theoretical is is really in thinking about the eight functions and what and how the eight functions work within the system which is as i'm suggesting type itself is the human journey uh, toward making our perceptions clearer and our judgments more sound and it is the insight that that dominant and auxiliary aspect of type um, where we get such rich observations about differences between uh, the types where we have a specific tactic that is to say for whatever reason um, our psyche came into the world with a leanings toward a particular dynamic because that dynamic uh, involving a dominant auxiliary is how we approach and manage our lived experiences. So as we come at this talk today, I just want to share with you that I, I, I'm going to try to come at it through three sort of big themes. One, what is the evidence for the dominant auxiliary and what is does the evidence suggest to us that we should pay attention to and how might that inform us in our work as well as our personal uh, relationships. Um, the second big theme that I want to hit on is the way in which being agile and flexible is vital to our ability to grow and develop and to, in fact, uh, loosen the power of one-sidedness so that we have an easier access to um, if we take Jung's eight functions as, as a way of understanding various psychological energies. And of course, as, as we all know, we've, we've come to understand that in vertical development, that is to say, the way in which we make sense of uh, our experiences and the ways we can understand those patterns um, have a reciprocal impact on how we, what it is we perceive and how it is we go about making decisions. So I, I am proposing to you that threaded through uh, the material that we're going to look at is how do we make the most sense in celebrating the dominant auxiliary and how then do we also make sense of the, the need for flexibility and agile use of the functions um, and indeed, uh, how we can then also ask ourselves some questions about frames of meaning that individuals have and the intersection with our type. <clears throat> now, I, I'm sure all of us know this particular quote that comes in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections and also in a different version is in the early part of Psychological Types. And I have intentionally highlighted what I think are some important phrases that often get missed. Um, when he said, it is from one psychological type which from the outset determines and limits a person's judgment, he, he was giving us, he was putting us on notice that our type is powerful, it is a driving force in our experience and in, in our psychological uh, makeup, and it is so powerful that in fact it will limit us unless 
uh, we work on and enhance our growth and development in particular ways. And he further says that, gosh, you know, it's about various aspects of consciousness uh, that we could begin to understand and embrace if we make sense of, of the model. Now, we've all seen this, I know, but when you think about it, it's so instantaneous in our individual experience. Um, we don't go around saying to ourselves, I'm perceiving right now, uh, or I'm judging right now, but in reality, we are. We are engaged in this uh, incredible seesaw of psychological energies where we're taking in and utilizing information and acting on that information. And Jung gave us a way, he gave us a language. Now, he, he, as some of us know, he wrote in various places that he, he said we have to be careful about language because language is a is a very limiting way of talking about something that's very complex and he even at one in one letter he called the functions metaphors for very complex processes and we tend to forget in a, in the atomization of type uh, we tend to forget that that he was trying to give us a way of understanding something that's in profoundly complicated and profoundly difficult, but accessible if we're willing to be patient with ourselves and patient with um, getting a handle on what's going on in our experience and how to decode those experiences in meaningful ways. Uh, I have begun to think about it as energies in the psyche that fit within a system of ongoing flows outward and inward. And I've tried to find ways and images to try to capture so that people can get a handle on the notion that, yes, we do have a set of preferences, and yes, those preferences are embedded inside of a rich system, and we could be uh, deeply and profoundly enriched in our understanding and patience and empathy with others if we understand how that whole system works and if we can acknowledge that yes I might have a preference for let's say extroverted thinking um, and that is fed very richly with introverted intuition using it that one particular example um, and yet if I understand that is embedded within a system of the psyche it, it gives me a chance to realize and invite uh, other perspectives and other sharing that can enrich my understanding and enrich the other person's understanding. One of the things that Hemio Storm wrote about in Seven Arrows and that I have so much appreciated about uh, other writings of other um, um, cultures is, is in, this, in the case of the Navajo and the Cheyenne, you were never allowed to say a person's perspective was wrong. The reason was that perspective was believed to be from the Great Spirit. The Great Spirit put a shard of itself inside of each person. And when we are together sharing about an experience or sharing of an observation, we, we all respected the sharing as coming from a source uh, that we all profoundly were in awe of with the Great Spirit. So. Yes, you had a different point of view, but because in the wisdom of the Great Spirit, when we're together and we work together in a collaborative way, we come up with better answers. We put more of the shards together to see the whole story. And I think in some ways, Jung was also trying to invite us to do that as well. Some of you have probably recently looked at Carol Shoemate's uh, recent book, and I, I, there are a number of things that Carol's done in the book that I found, she said in a way that I very much resonate with, uh, and I just want to highlight a couple of those. Uh, she says, Jung's eight mental functions are modes of consciousness, not the contents of consciousness. And, and I think that profound difference is one that's worthy of uh, a great deal of conversation, and I'm sorry we won't have time to get into that today. 
But she also went on to say behaviors are sourced in these functions and are not equivalent to them. Further, psychological type, which is not predictability skills or behaviors, only a tendency to develop them is a profound principle. Now, I, I, I think I've used that line or something like that for the last 20 years in trying to help people understand why the MBTI, for example, should not be used in career selection or job selection or career placement. Um, we all know that it happens, and no matter how hard we try to get people to understand, a preference or a pattern is not a prediction. It gives us some probabilities and some tendencies, but not necessarily any guarantees. And further, it works against the wholeness of the model when that is the way in which it gets used. In psychological types, Jung made the statement that it, uh, our habitual mode of reaction is characterized by the use of the most reliable and efficient function, which we have come to call the dominant function. He also said, if you look closer, we will notice that there's a less differentiated function of secondary importance present in consciousness, exerting a co-determining influence, and is different in every respect from the nature of the primary function, which, again, is the basis for which we know Isabel Myers came to the perspective that, gosh, he was trying to clue us in to an auxiliary which was extremely powerful and the ways in which it functions in the individual. In one of his letters, this coding, by the way, that you see is in a book of letters from Jung. In one of his letters, he makes the statement that the attitude type, and we all know for Jung, attitude type meant extroversion, introversion. He used the word attitude to mean extroversion, introversion was more or less consistent, but the function type is subject to all manner of changes in the course of life. Well, that's interesting. That's a very interesting proposition that um, the energies around extroversion and introversion are so profound and persistent that it shows up throughout life. But as we go through life, if I would argue we're open to experience and open to learning, we in fact um, expand our dominant and aux our auxiliary. We enrich our access to and use of the other functions. Um, and I think, in a sense, he was trying to give us that message. In collected papers, he makes the statement that the development of the contrary function that was heretofore unconscious leads to individual uh, the individual beyond the type and thereby to a new relationship to the world and mind. And again, I think he's inviting us to consider that just because you have a dominant auxiliary doesn't mean you close the door on the other functions. He goes on to say in psychological types, uh, the superior function is always an expression of, of the conscious personality. And of course, I think we've, uh, those of us who've been working with type for a long time would say, boy, that's certainly true for individuals who have um, a, a, a well-developed dominant function for certain. And he goes on to make the observation that uh, in uh, the less differentiated functions fall into the category of things that simply happen to one, meaning the absence of intention, the absence of conscious awareness, uh, that we have these moments where uh, we have just a slight insight into the complexity of our psyche because of something we say, see, or do um, that we could then tie to natural expressions of the functions. He says of them, that the four functions characterize the orientation of consciousness, a restatement in one of his letters, which I, I think is important, especially in that letter where he goes on to say, in its unconscious condition, it is contaminated with the collective unconscious, meaning um, those functions that have not been brought to 
conscious awareness have a greater chance of being um, he uses the word contaminated meaning influenced by and flavored by um, archetypal energies so all of that, those propositions by Jung naturally lead to the question, is there enough evidence, not just simply personal belief, that type, as suggested as a dominant auxiliary, is a real present power in the way we can understand the human experience? And if that's so, then an ISTP and an ISTJ should have very different psychological experiences and show themselves in the world in very, very different ways. I just use those two side by sides because the only the, to the unknowing world, the only difference between an ISTP and an ISTJ, and I, this is laughable, is the P and the J. <laughs> um, I can't tell you the number of times I've had people say to me, well, there's only one letter difference, so how big of a difference can that be? And yet those of us who know type and type dynamics would say a, an ISTP reality and an ISTJ reality is profoundly different and is one that needs to be understood for its profound difference. But the question, of course, is do we have evidence? Can we go forth in our work as coaches and facilitators, as counselors, that we can lean into this proposition of a dominant auxiliary with confidence? And I'm going to suggest to you, yes, a robust, resounding yes. And I want to pull from a couple of sources of data, some of which I've shared with you, some of you in the past. Uh, for some of you, this will be new. Um, and also take a look at um, some evidence that I think matters. Some of you uh, may have downloaded my paper from capped. Uh, it was a piece done in the 90s and it amazes me, I must tell you, that this has not been replicated. Um, the Center for Creative Leadership allowed me to access their database where we had uh, at the time uh, we, we, we had what was before step two um, the form that allowed us to have all the various scales of the MBTI. We had personality tools like the California Psychological Inventory, the Fibro B, multiple multi-rater comparison instruments. Um, we had tests like the Hidden Figures Test and the Shipley Test of Mental Abilities, which enabled me to analyze how different the types were. Now, I, I want to tell you that I have adamantly refused to do preference level research. And I've done that partially out of a commitment to Mary McCauley, who asked me when I met her and we started working together in 1989. She said to me, please, please, please only do whole type work do not do we don't need another set of correlations between the ei of the mbti and the ei of such and such personality test we don't need another set of correlations uh, on this that and the other what we do need is evidence that helps us look at the differences between the whole types so that we can build the case and build the argument that type dynamics are a real thing and that the whole type uh, comes together in ways that you cannot capture by just looking at uh, individual scales. Uh, this particular research was so massive in the work that it uh, produced that it has fed a lot of the work that I've been doing ever since. And it will feed the last piece I plan to write, uh, let's hope the fates will give me the time to do it, um, where I am going to pull from this all of the evidence uh, that I can muster uh, to, to discuss the ways in which type development from the inside out um, for the 16 types uh, can occur. 
in that evidence, I'm just going to show you a couple of slides. I looked at differences across the types with each factor. So example, independent mindedness. And it, who would be surprised that INTJs would have the highest score on independent mindedness? I mean, that, does that surprise any of us? No. But to be able to show the profound difference uh, across the types on, on different scales, uh, such in this case a cluster of scales, uh, looking at the differences of the types, is the way in which we're now able to begin to make the argument and the claim that there are real differences in, uh, in the type. So ISTJ and ISTP, or INFP and INFJ, or <laughs> ENTP and ENTJ are really, really different psychological animals. And I know we all know that, but having the evidence so the world could pay attention to that uh, has been partially my goal, is how do we push back against those who constantly argue that type is worthless, that it doesn't give us any insight into the human experience, and uh, how does it, uh, why does it persist? It persists because it's a constructive, positive psychology, and those of us who use it know uh, that the very differences I just uh, alluded to in this particular um, example uh, matter. But here's the piece that I plan to say more about in the future. Um, and just want to make clear uh, in this sharing with you today. In that research that I did, uh, there was a scale and it's considered by most, uh, I would say, well healed psychologists, research psychologists, there's a scale called Vector 3 or Ego Integration, which is considered one of the most robust and steady scales in the measurement of personality um, in the industry. It's in the CPI and it happens to be a scale that enables in a global way to have an indication of does the person, does the individual seem to have an understanding of his or her range of capabilities and skills? Do they seem to have an ability to balance uh, their um, sense of self and adaptation in the world in constructive ways? And do they utilize their psychological resources to be resilient in the face of stress and challenges? And Obviously, people low on that scale uh, are individuals who have a host of troubles, and those who are high on that scale uh, tend to be individuals who are perceived um, by any indi index, any independent set of index, as being more resilient, more happy, more satisfied in who they are, and able to flex and respond and be agile as needed by the demands that, that face them. So I, I took the scale and I broke all the type data into three groupings. Those of the 16 types on the low end, those of the 16 types in the middle, and those of the 16 types on the high end. As you would imagine, there's a smaller number of the types on the low and on the high end, and most of the, of the types are uh, in the middle. But what is unambiguously clear is it doesn't matter what the type is who's at the top of the bucket or the type who's at the bottom of the bucket. Um, you see quite pronounced... Uh, patterns in the way in which people experience them, in the way they talk about themselves. And what is especially interesting to me is that those in the high end of this scale not only were seen as more effective, and again, it did not matter which type, were seen as more effective, more engaged in their environment and with others, more interpersonally capable and savvy, um, having greater conceptual fluency across an array of issues and higher self-confidence and self-assurance. Um, ag again, I cannot say this loud enough, regardless of the type. So there's something about this 
lens, this, this particular aspect of human nature, where we might ask ourselves if, if this particular uh, uh, factor is a core factor for the well-being or not so well-being of individuals, um, maybe we should be paying attention to that and pay attention to it in some very intentional ways. So I would propose that facilitating activities that help identify and learn the eight functions will enhance development and it will enable a person to own their own pattern and realize that their resources that they have access to, not to that it should be their new personality, but simply a resource that they can access in intentional ways. Um, and that in so doing, we enrich the person's sense of self-confidence and the person's um, deeper understanding of themselves as they move forward in dealing with life challenges. And it helps people see that if you're had, and by that I mean psychologically had, by a pattern, and you are in a fixed one-sided approach to life's demands, um, that's typically going to create distress for you and discomfort for you. And fortunately, there's a fix for that. And we, wanna, we want to use that fix as best we can. I, I put this funny in only because I feel like um, all of us who've been using type for a long time have been saying the same kinds of things about type being powerful and useful and pragmatic and helpful we could only get you to pay attention to the richness of the model. Um, it, it seems to me I have responded to endless criticisms of type. Uh, almost always, it's the same issues, it's the same misunderstandings, it's the same um, challenges against something that the indicator for one and per psychological type for another was never intended to solve. But nonetheless, we push forward looking at the evidence. Now, I've been collecting evidence through a tool that came out of the, the research I mentioned earlier. I found that there were 64 behaviors, eight for each of the functions, that seemed to consistently show up and could be identified by others to help us uh, verify some of the ways in which those type behaviors and tendencies emerge. And so um, I ask people, you know, if you do type 360, and I invite you and I'll tell you, you, you can do it free of charge, no cost at all, should you want to participate in the study. I've been trying to collect this data for a number of years. I've asked people, um, gosh, you know, have three people who know you indicate how often these behaviors show up. And do they identify the type pattern that you identify, that you have verified? And fairly consistently, guess what? People do. So not only does a person self-report that I happen to be an INFP, by golly, I behave in ways that other people see and react and, they, and words and choices I make that cause them to say, when they hear that behavior or respond to that behavior, it confirms what has been uh, personally verified. How much do the raters agree? Well, uh, across the different raters, across the uh, 16 types, lo and behold, by and large, uh, people who've been rating other people's behavior pretty much agree that these various patterns are consistent and present. And so as Jung suggested and as Myers proposed, um, there is uh, a reality to these type dynamics um, that we, we can even ask people, uh, how does it show up in terms of effectiveness? And it's on a five point scale. And without getting deeply into the meaning of each and every one of these patterns, you can see um, and with the exception of ISFP, it's the only one where across the 16 types, 
in the ratings of effectiveness, it turns out that the dominant function is seen as more effective than the auxiliary function. Now, you have to be mindful that um, people aren't, they're rating behaviors. They don't have any idea what it's attached to. They're simply saying, I see this particular behavior and I, this person does it and it shows up in my mind on a scale of one to five as being more or less effective. And when we then analyze those patterns, we see how it works with the 16 types. Another way of looking at data and another way of affirming the power of types is to, to look at what I think of as some biographical observations. So for years, maybe you do this too, but since the late 80s, early 90s, whenever I was doing type-alike groups, and it didn't matter whether this was in China or in Europe or in Mexico or in you name it, when I would ask type of groups to sort of think about and create an illustration, these illustrations I'm going to share are fairly constant illustrations. I mean, the elements of the illustrations are almost always the same. I could put up 15 ISTJ illustrations and they all have something to do with um, how we organize and manage and where time is used and how time is used and how things are prioritized. I especially love the ESTP one on this example. When the ESTPs got together, they said, well, we can make this really quick. You know, here's a formula. Get it? <laughs> now let's get on to the next topic. So, as over the years, I've collected these images and I've asked people uh, typologically, tell me, you know, how does your head work and what really speaks to you as you present yourself to the world? You see uh, that these patterns show up again and again and again. So uh, my message to you is, as we do these kinds of exercises, it's useful to keep the evidence, by the way, such that you can help other people see how rich and different these patterns are. But also, um, you show your audience at the time, wow, these are really profoundly different ways of seeing the world and making sense of the world. And if we do operate that differently, um, we need to create a different kind of conversation. We need to create a different kind of space where we are discussing and sharing and engaged with one another in rich and inviting and hopefully caring ways. You know, as I've gone about this business over the years, it seems to me every time I turn around, there's a new paradigm shift. And maybe you feel the same way. Um, in this world that we're in, uh, it seems like I go take a trip and sure enough, come back and there's something else that's that's added to the picture. One of the things that, that has been added for me, which I'm about to talk about, has to do with um, the vertical development conversation, which I believe is also tied uh, very much to the typological uh, conversation or how we enrich our functions and how that enriches our sense of meaning making. Now, I think that we've seen enough evidence that the functions are there. They're, they're useful ways of making sense of um, our experience. The more we can make them conscious in our lives, the, the, the more we're able not to be tripped up by them. Uh, after all, um, as Jung told us, this work is hard work. Uh, inner work is hard work. Um, and if we are truly going to uh, maximize the gift of type, then we need to ask ourselves, am, am I up for um, the work that's going to be required? And sure enough, um, Jung reminds us in poignant ways that that conscious effort um, does re require focus and intention. And I want to stick with that word for a little bit, intention. Now, uh, this train of thought that I've been dealing with for a couple of years 
prompted me to to create the the uh, Pierman integrator because I I wanted to create a space for people to say yes I know what's really comfortable for me I also know what the environment sort of re expects of me and I need to own that and how that shows up and I need to be cognizant of how that shows up and um, if I learn also some things about flexibility, I can learn what I need to do <clears throat> to be more agile and flexible um, in the way I see things and the way I act and judge things. Now, throughout the data collection, and again, this information is going to be uh, available at some point, I'm going to make all of this a part of the story on our observations around the types, I want us to see the message that our mental function energies are present and showing up in the world, whether we're fully conscious of them or not. People are seeing us engage in ways and seeing us do things in ways that we hardly are aware of in many, many cases. And yet they have an impact on the world. And I happen to think we're better off when we first begin to realize indeed how present those energies are in our life and how those energies impact other uh, people. You know, when Jung said every individual is an exception to the rule, I think he was trying to invite us to consider um, that, yes, we do have some consistencies. There's conformity about life and us and there's also uniqueness and that uniqueness comes i believe when we allow ourselves to be intentional students it's my conclusion really that that when i say inescapable truth uh, when i think about our psyche and i think about the role type plays in making sense of things um, I would say that when we are looking at behavior, it's kind of truly the tip of the iceberg and underneath it is uh, the deep, deep roots of uh, our host of life experiences. It's the way our intrapsychic uh, evolution is occurring, the pressures that we may be under in, in any given moment um, that are situationally pushing on us. And of course, um, and we're just really beginning to understand how our learning and meaning mindsets matter um, in growth uh, and development. And so I, I want to encourage us to think about our typology, if you will, um, as nestling in all of this. And that in fact, when we expand our uh, awareness of and use of the eight functions, we are given ourselves an opportunity to uh, expand uh, our ability to adapt to these challenges and to learn and grow in new and different ways. I use the word diva as a way to, to shorthand a discussion about growth and development in this sense. We, we know that diversity of experience and intensity of experience, variations in experience, and I use the word adverse, which simply means out of our comfort zone, um, is, is essential to growth. We, we simply don't grow if we, we don't have experiences that get us to compare and contrast uh, we don't grow if we are not engaged in uh, doing things in new and different ways. Um, and it's just vital that we think more intentionally about our kind of diva experiences. Are we uh, putting ourselves in the place of greatest opportunity um, as we think about our own growth and development? We know now that we've had three decades of high-end neuroscience that everything in us is programmed to seek comfort, avoid pain, and find an efficient path to achieve both of those. And that efficiency is important because it helps us reserve energy 
that might well be needed later. And of course, this fosters the very one-sidedness Jung was observing. It fosters the very bias that we all are aware of in a whole variety of ways, as well as other well-programmed parts of the way our brain works. So I, I would propose that identifying perspectives and behaviors is, is an aspect of development that we could be more intentional about and use that intentionality to um, test ourselves and expand ourselves through some new experiences. Now, in my most recent revision of I'm Not Crazy, I've included a chart, some charts. I'm going to show you one here in a minute that comes from asking lots of people of the various uh, types, what things do you find most satisfying and rewarding and what have you learned from those? What those are those hobbies or activities at work that you've done? And what did you learn? And of course, it won't surprise you that um, the things we're drawn to uh, are satisfying at a whole variety of levels. Uh, so. Just know that the idea here isn't to make us become more, you know, uh, opposite of our natural type pattern, but to give us an opportunity to explore and experience and activate, to use Carol Shoemate's Schu comment uh, that I utilized earlier, activate those functions so that they contain experiences and energies that we can access and use. Now, I, I know I'm coming up on the end of my time, and I want to hit on this topic because I think it's really uh, vital that we start adding it to our type conversation. Uh, Bob Kagan at Harvard introduced it uh, most formally in the early 90s when he said, you know, subject-object relations is where it's at. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting, Carl Jung said the same thing. He used subject-object relations in a lot of his uh, essays and comments and in his letters to try to elevate the reality that if we, our psyche is subject to something, we can't well uh, utilize that in constructive ways. It's only when we, we make it the object of our awareness, when we make it the focus of our attention, that we're able then to say, ah, I, I understand why I need to do more of X, Y, and Z, and then what I might need to do to integrate that into my sense of self. And what, what Kagan and Jung, I believe, were trying to get us to get a handle on is that <clears throat> we, we can, and I, I think in many, many ways, the... Uh, the ways in which we reflect and integrate new insights and observations is when we're trying to realize that we have been caught by something or, or in the grip of something that has had influence over us in more ways than we perhaps um, realized. And by getting a handle on that, we're then able, in fact, to uh, begin to understand it and decide how to integrate it more intentionally in the way in which we move forward. Now, if you know Kagan's work, you know that he identified five uh, sort of referral meaning systems and the four most evident in adults, He, I have labeled rule referent, social referent, self-referent, and systems referent. And I've also very intentionally put this triangle of flexibility and adaptability with a little bit of it at the rule reference stage and a whole lot of it at the systems reference stage because it appears to me that that, that is in fact the case, that when a person is rule referent, they're less likely to be very flexible in choosing um, other options and ranges of experiences. People who are system referent tend to be um, pondering and have a sort of hypothetical way of approaching things and realize that truth is an emerging reality, not a, uh, a, a, a yes or no reality. <clears throat> so when you look at um, the system 
and it's it's interesting to ask and I get this question all the time well is it such and such type much much more system oriented than such and such type and I would tell you no not necessarily and I would also point out that if you remember my vector 3 research that I talked about earlier when you look at the additional material across the 16 types all of the types can be in a systems referent orientation. Um, all of the types can be in a rule referent orientation, though you may find that hard to believe. And I would tell you, if you're finding it hard to believe, I would challenge you how you are thinking about um, type um, in, in ways that may in fact be one-sided. You know, there are potential linkages I found as I've talked to people and listened to their way of making sense of things and making, if you will, meaning of their experiences. And what I have found is the only way to get them to move from one stage to another is to get them to do the very subject-object relations analysis I just talked about getting them to see that they're inclined to be in the grip of a particular experience or a particular perspective and what is it going to take to understand that and to learn a lesson from it in order to to move into another way of seeing life and experience i've noticed these kinds of big patterns that seem to come across um, across the cognitive functions and um, think, I think that uh, when I uh, consider helping people in their growth and development, understanding where they are in their meaning-making system becomes very important because it tells us how much energy they rely uh, and put into such things as the rules or SOPs of their life versus uh, their hypothetical questions and um, uh, seeing things from uh, lenses of complexity and emerging options. So I, I just throw it out to say to you that, that we should be thinking about uh, type with some additional lenses um, that I think in our practical work, not that our clients would ever understand any of this, not that they need to, but we need to be thinking about the richness of type as it cuts across new insights into the human experience. Just a couple I, more minutes, I, Roger. Sorry, just to say okay. just a couple more minutes. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I would just argue that we, we need to see this particular aspect of development, uh, as I was suggesting to you, as an intrapsychic event, that we need to nurture curiosity, we need to invite people to uh, explore the full range of their functions so that they see the fullness of their capabilities in rich ways. So uh, in sum, I would just say to you, I've tried to argue that we have plenty of evidence that the dominant auxiliary are real, that in fact it, it uh, is a tactic that comes natural to us and it's a tactic that works for us sometimes, doesn't work for us when it gets in the way of us being flexible and agile and responding to the challenges. We can develop our capabilities to be more flexible and agile by engaging in DIVA, making sure we pursue intentionally experiences that get us to access uh, aspects of ourselves that we haven't paid attention to and um, we need to carefully look at the ways in which we make sense of those experiences because I think uh, vertical development is, is capable and possible uh, when we do that, that kind of additional work. Now, if you want to contribute to the type study, you just email me at this address and I'll send you the information as we continue to collect evidence. And the day's going to come not far away. I'm just going to stop and start writing on what is in the database. Um, but if you have people that you'd like to have them have the experience, they can get a, the, the report, no cost, I don't care. I'd just like to have, I, I wanted to have 10,000 people 
but I'm clearly not going to make it to that number um, so that it would make for a fairly strong and robust uh, argument that the evidence for type is real, the behaviors are real, um, the ways in which people behave uh, can be understood and that we can leverage those um, in ourselves and understand those in others. So I would appreciate your, your questions. I know we're out of time, but if you have questions or two and want to hold on, I'm happy to to deal with them. This PowerPoint will be up um, on, uh, on the site for people to download and look at and reflect on later. So I know, Jerry, I, 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 we don't have much time, but... Um, uh, you're right, Roger. Thank you. Was, Thank you so much. I think what I'll do is I'll formally close the session, but do hang on for a few minutes if you have questions for, for Roger, because I know he's happy to, to stay on. If you are leaving, uh, I hope you're going for a few minutes to the uh, closing session for half an hour um, up till half past the hour uh, as we conclude the conference tonight. But, uh, but let me thank you, Roger, so much for a very a rich session full of uh, wisdom, lots of content for us to revisit and apply, uh, and also a tantalizing glimpse of some forthcoming work. So. Thank you so much for, for the hard work and uh, and all you've you've uh, given us tonight. So thank you. Oh, you're kind. Thank you. Let me just stop the.